Uh, welcome everybody to this session on future-proofing businesses in a sustainable world. I'm delighted to say we have a whole selection of global leaders from advertising to talk about the challenge of how to put brands and their advertising partners on a more sustainable path around the world. So I'm really pleased to welcome Angie Gifford, who's VP EMEA for Meta, Karen Sorda, who's President Global Clients and Agency Solutions at Google, Sergio Lopez, who's the Global Head of Production at Publicis Group, and Ashling Ryan, who is Managing Partner for Sustainability at Ogilvy Consulting. And thank you all so much for, enjoy, for joining us today in this session. I want to explore with each of you how you see your roles in our advertising industry evolving uh, to meet the challenge of creating a more sustainable world. So I'm going to start with an opening question for all of you. Could each one of you give me one compelling reason for a leadership team watching this to put sustainability at the top of their agenda? And if I may, I'll start with Angie. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Stephen. And it's great, great to be here at this fantastic panel. You pointed it out, an amazing panel of leaders at the Agnet Zero Global Summit. And um, to your question, I'm very glad you raised this because when it comes to climate change, I think we really, really need good uh, news here. And when you think about the business response, I think um, we have reason to be optimistic because it would be hard to find an ambitious leadership team today that does not have sustainability on the agenda. And if you look at KPMG, their results show from a big research they have done, 70% of the CEOs globally believe that stakeholder scrutiny on ESG initiatives will continue to accelerate. So ESG, it's becoming really a table stakes. And that's progress, because if you look a few years ago, that wasn't always the case. And what happened is the business case for Actiony has become incredibly strong, I would say. And when you think about attracting customers, employee satisfaction and raising capital, a strong sustainability policy is absolutely critical here. Almost 80% of the investors uh, says ESG is an important factor in their investment decision and 50% would sell their investment if a company is not showing enough action to address um, ESG issues. So they're really watching this. And when investors talk, you know that better than I do, Stephen, about climate. It's about mitigating risk, yes, but it's also about opportunities. So having a climate strategy is about future-proving your business and it's really serious business. And last but not least, there is no one-fits-all approach. So different industry, and I think that's also very important, have unique, a unique a set of challenges. And it's going to be very, very different for each of the business. So overall, I think we can feel optimistic that it's being taken seriously. And um, in the business community, we can see change, and change will continue and will really happen. Thank you, Angela. There are some fantastic statistics there, and I think particularly investor pressure is such a critical point in this to drive this to the top of the agenda. Uh, I know Google, it's at the top of your agenda as a, as a company. Uh, Karen, perhaps you can reflect on this from the clients that you deal with, uh, you know, about how, how we can help get it to the top of the agenda for all of the clients that, that the industry serves. Yeah, the, you know, look, there's definitely no time to waste. Thank you, Stephen. And I think what's good for the planet is good for business now. And I think that's a really important uh, step forward for businesses today. The question isn't really why leadership team should put this on their agenda, but how to put words and pledges into action and make progress. And joining AdNet Zero and working with all of us is a critical component of that as far as advertising goes. And so the time really is now to, to begin to have more impact. I think that's such a great point because, yes, it, it, it's there in the annual reports. It's high up on the agendas. It's high on investor uh, uh, agendas. But actually, it's about action now. It's about changing every single facet of our business. So, Ashling, uh, you're consulting a lot of clients about sustainability in their own businesses. Perhaps give us uh, your perspective on how do you turn that action, uh, ambition rather, into action? Uh, yes, I mean... I I think that there is a huge emphasis now on really showing impact and and ins ensuring that you are have showing tangible impact and action. Uh, so it's very much got to come from a strategy on a page into how that's translating. Uh, and, and I think depending on where a client is on their journey in the transition, uh, that can shift. I mean, you know, oftentimes there are great commitments, there are lots of great actions, but they're not necessarily 
uh, getting traction with their stakeholders. They're not necessarily getting credit for the work that they're doing. So sometimes it's about elevating that strategy and really incorporating a broader sustainability vision uh, to take forward uh, and really thinking about how you can create a win for for multiple stakeholders and work at that intersection of stakeholders. And, you know, I think one of the really important things is to how do you you, uh, protect your triple license to operate? So whether that is governments with ever shifting regulatory uh, changes, legislative changes, depending on different markets around the world, but also in terms of uh, public license, whether that's employees or consumers or civil society, and then finally financial, as as Angie pointed out, in terms of the investor audience and in terms of uh, your own shareholders. And uh, really finding the win-win for each of those stakeholders is hugely important to achieving success. I was just going to give you an example of a client that we worked with who I think has really achieved this uh, is Nestle. Uh, you know, and their sustainability vision is about championing um, regenerative food systems at scale. And I think that that really speaks to the multiple stakeholders and how and how they can get involved in a really transformational vision of the future and their role in, in, in that as, as the world's biggest food and beverage company. That's a wonderful example. And I think that, that you know, in effect, the, the complete repurposing of a business around this is not only obviously good for the planet and good for all the stakeholders, but actually good for business as well. And I think that's this, that idea of a win-win-win. Uh, you know, this is where competition is going to be driving as well. Uh, and that comp- competitive forces are going to be an incredibly important part of that. I think, um, Sergio, finally, a perspective from you. Obviously, global head of production at one of the biggest agency groups in the world. You're serving many, many thousands of clients. How do you see it from an agency perspective? Well, beyond from an agency perspective, the the part of my of my remit being production, which is bringing ideas to life, means that <clears throat> my departments globally have a, a carbon footprint of more than twenty five percent in the industry. Right, like production, yes, because of the material aspect of that. Um, and with that comes a big responsibility because at the end of the day, we're, we're a business that connects with people where people work um, in our teams and, and, and our audiences. So we have, I think that we have an obligation, obviously, to make, uh, to make the, the, the planet a better place on, on the environment, on um, cultural diversity, you know, in all kinds of aspects. But especially in, in, in this area, in ESG, very important because of the impact that we have. And one of the things that we see across the world is different maturity levels in different in different markets, which from where I see globally, my responsibility or the responsibility of leadership is be able to bring best practices for some markets and implement it in, in others and help them help them around the, the journey to accelerate that and uh, and help people understand that actually we've now in a position where there is the the, the ESG agenda and the clients um, pursue for agility and efficiencies are very much aligned when you look at when you look at savings of time of spend um, so be able to build those solutions and articulate it for clients on things that are very material that is that is critical on how we see it it's such a good point and i think that that i mean all of you are in businesses that have global reach and global scale and, and talking about nestle and other big advertisers like that you know it's the, the change that's going to have to happen in the world has to be led by global businesses because they have the power and they just Sergio to your point about best practice taking it from one part of the world to the next so let, thinking more about the specifics within your own businesses um, and Angie turning to meta um, what are you seeing from the businesses that your platforms serve when it comes to the, the growth in sustainable products and services? Yeah, um, see, we are, you know, up there. I mean, we hear more and more and more every single day. Um, And I think one reason why the businesses are so engaged is that consumer today expect action on climate change. And uh, we're really seeing a lot of evidence on our platform um, where there's been over 30% increase in people just searching the term sustainability on Facebook and Instagram 
over the past couple of years. So if you look at 2019 to 2021. We also did a, a, a survey with Accenture this year and found that 70% of the consumers that we surveyed in Europe had chosen to purchase a sustainable product over a non-sustainable alternative in the last six months. And sometimes they're really also able and willing to pay more for this. Uh, this shows up in advertising effectiveness, by the way, too, from our own testing with clients. We have seen that it can get better results, higher conversion and lower cost when they use sustainability messaging in their ads. And we talk a lot about the big businesses, of course, and the climate change, but we work a lot also with small and medium, medium customers. And we want also them to take action. And sometimes they don't have the resources, they don't have the money to do so. Um, but we think 99% of all businesses in the EU contribute, you know, uh, are small businesses. So this is basically more than half of the uh, Europe's uh, GDP. So the small businesses are really, really important. So we started the Meta um, Boost Go to Green. To a guide to green campaign, which was very successful. So far, we have 1.3 million SMBs across Europe engaged in this program. And we really want to be the partner here. I would call it the partner in crime, supporting them on sustainability going forward and really making, like you said it, you know, making action, taking action and, you know, having good results. So not only the big companies, but particularly we are focused also on the SMBs. Thank you. And I think, uh, yeah, that, that, huge part of the economy that is SMEs needs to be part of the journey as well as the big global companies. And, and I know, Karen, Google, obviously, like Meta, reaches a huge part of the SME community. But thinking about that spectrum, because both your platforms serve clients, large, small uh, and intermediate, uh, it, what, what are you seeing um, from, from, from a Google perspective about how you can help your advertisers encourage more sustainable behaviours? Yeah, we look at this from three different angles. One is what can we do to lead as we move toward uh, carbon, uh, you know, free energy for all of our businesses for 2030? How can we operate 24-7 in that uh, realm? We also are looking at how we enable consumers. So we have a pledge to get a billion consumers to make more sustainable choices. And we look at the way they use some of our products like maps and provide uh, you know, more efficient routes to wherever you might be going. We have 170,000 kilometers of bike trails and, and roads that allow bikes now on our mapping system. We also have hotels and flights uh, where you can make eco-friendly choices, whether that's uh, you know, some uh, energy, efficiency route on a flight or a hotel that practices that. And we're partnering with uh, the UN to look at content and how to you know, support those authoritative voices on climate change. And we have ad policies against climate denial. So all of those things are helping consumers. And consumers tell us that they want, uh, four out of five consumers want to make sustainable choices, but they don't know how. And um, you know, one out of five, it, is saying, I might know how. So this is why we're trying to make that really part of their daily habits. And then we're also supporting customers around um, lots of different things. One, our cloud is the most sustainable, large scale cloud uh, resource for customers to use today, as well as uh, we, our Google.org has worked with a, a small company called Normative that allows you to do your own um, calculations on your company. So companies of all sizes can begin to use that calculation tool and begin to better understand what their carbon footprint is. So lots of different ways to... Lots of different support. ways. And I, I'm, a, I'm a huge supporter of uh, the bike routes on Google Maps in London. It works Good. brilliantly. So thank you for that wonderful service. Um, I may turn now to, to Sergio. You, you began to touch on the, the role of production uh, in, in this changing, um, the, the changing way we, we're doing business. Perhaps you could elaborate more about how you're looking at more sustainable ways to answer your clients' briefs? In production, when, when we say production, people tend to think a film shoot. And production is a much longer, is a much longer thing. But it starts from creative development, stimulus for the campaign, of course the shoot, and then all the distribution, which at a time where we're talking about precision marketing, uh, just the the, that part of the ecosystem is is huge. So I think that starts with visibility. We we develop. We started twenty years ago developing an internal tool that helps us have visibility end to end called Alice. 
and then partnering with with partners like you, right? Like that's why we have at net zero, which is a specialist on visibility for for production, and start looking at different paths and how do we optimize those paths. And as I was saying before, it actually goes hand in hand with with efficiencies on the on the production side. We realize that when we're looking about efficiencies and agility, be able to do remote shooting, right, without having to travel people across the world, um, having people supervise from from London and be able to connect with our studios in South Africa without having to travel five people halfway across the world and the efficiencies that it has, not having to have people outside the, the headquarters and yet having great connectivity is great. Going from building sets or location to using virtual sets, right, which is something that, that we have three virtual sets that have been built this year alone. Just imagine like all the savings from building, throwing away um, from kitchens for food for food production to to some of our automotive clients, which is a big part of our portfolio of clients. When back in the day for running footage, we have to actually drive cars to the middle of the desert and beautiful days. Now we can do it in a studio with a lot of the efficiency. So that's, what, that's on the production side. When you look at the bigger supply chain, especially when we work, talk about distribution, and precision marketing, even the smallest decision and the visibility, such as file size, right? Like we uh, we know that in technology, all the camera makers have been increasing resolution of the files unnecessarily because people cannot cannot see. So when we made the decision to just make sure that we operate files in high definition as opposed to 8K, that decision alone saved four tons of CO2 across the board because now it's not just we do one video and we put it on 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 pre-roll is that video becomes thousands if not millions of videos with different tags with different with different versions through all our tools so be able to constantly look and by the way that also means because the files are smaller the rendering happens faster we're spending less money on servers so that's what i'm talking about like the always looking at what is the relationship between a decision that is right for our clients or for the business but also right for the for the environment using those those two things, and those are the things that we're implementing across the across the world because they make a big impact. But, and I think there's a theme here, which is about massive change happens by lots of many, many millions of small incremental changes that are moving our economy and the way we work and the way we make, the way we interact to more sustainable uh, ways of working. I mean, the impact, to your point, the impact that we have, we my, my team looks over 9,000 briefs a year globally. So the... And as you know, production is very nuanced. So be able, the impact that you have every time that you change one little thing, the scale that you have, it's, it's enormous. And, and actually, obviously, in, a, in an advisory role, in a consulting role, uh, you're helping people on the journey. And I think it might be, you know, we've talked about a lot of the progress here. Maybe perhaps talk about some of the barriers that you, you, you've seen and, and perhaps give the audience some insight in how to overcome the barriers to moving their uh, clients to more decarbonized ways of operating? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think the biggest barrier at the moment is um, the the actual navigating the economic and geopolitical context, uh, which is providing a lot of challenge. And and I think that the, the fear is and... Uh, is to uh, succumb to short-term pressures and really be focused on, you know, quarterly reporting, um, and really, you know, to to lose sight of or roll back on commitments. Uh, now, you know, it, in most of our clients that we're seeing, we're, that is not an issue because they understand the importance of it. They understand that it is about future-proofing their business, and they understand that it is important to to really uh, manage their uh, reputation going forward. So they are doubling down on thinking about, you know, how, what is their innovation strategy? What is their performance strategy? And what is their citizenship strategy? So effectively, the three main drivers of reputation and, in, and you know, success. Um, I do think also they're thinking about, you know, where, where can they compete? Where should they comply and where can they lead and I think that that's really really important as well but most importantly I think we you know the the biggest barrier is if you start to think of sustainability with a cost mindset and I think that you know what we really need to encourage uh, because it's simply true is that it is a, it should be a growth mindset that this is absolutely not a situation of um, can't afford to but it's a situation of can't afford not to 
Uh, and I think that those who succumb to those short term pressures uh, will will pay a price later because people will remember, investors will remember, consumers will remember, employees will remember. So I think that's very important. Also, I think it's hugely important to uh, build credibility and uh, to to be really, really clear in terms of transparent reporting as well and show progress. Uh, so one of the things that we do is we build a lot of partnerships with either NGO partners or government partners. Uh, we do a lot of work with the United Nations, UNFCCC, UN Women, um, and of course WPP. We have a deeper relationship with the UN, of course WHO and various other organisations. Uh, but I think it's really important to to think about that and also to really be ambitious about real innovation versus iterative innovation and uh, and also to I mean for instance an example I love recently is Colgate have uh, developed the world's first recyclable toothpaste tube which may you know which is actually huge when you think of their penetration around the world and what I love about that example is that they have uh, open source that that innovation and that technology to all of their competitors so that it can genuinely have an impact. And, and I think that that's a really important aspect. Uh, so, I mean, finally, I think, you know, there has to be vigilance around messaging, around green claims. And I think we're seeing, you know, increasing um, vigilance around that, which is as it should be. And that's hugely important. Um, so yes, I I'm think that's a, that's, that's a great point about uh, Colgate's open sourcing because I think if I think about Adnet Zero as a program, it's an open source program. It's available to the whole industry, but we describe it as a floor, not a ceiling. You know, it's to get everybody to the best level we can get, and then we want to drive competition, as we as we've heard throughout this call about how we compete to get there further, faster, better. Uh, and I think that's a really important point. There are really important points there for for in effect, open sourcing and, and cross-industry collaboration, of which uh, our, our program is, a, is a, an example. Um, we've got a few minutes left, and I just wanted to think about the journey that we're on and just get a quick sense from each of you. Um, how long do you think it's going to be? If, if you take where we are now as a, an advertising industry and where we ne need to get to, um, a, a perspective from each of you about how long that journey will take in your in your particular role. So thinking about your business and, and your role. So what's the window of time we're looking at? And, and maybe let's start with Sergio on that one. I think, first of all, I, I think that this journey should never be over, right? Because with innovation, we always need to we always need to to be making changes, either drastic changes or or small innovation. Based on what I see in the last few years, I think that we're going to start seeing drastic changes within the next two three years um very very quickly on on ways of working we started seeing impact over the last five years on things that could be done by individuals on on individual events and now we're starting to see things that are operationally systematically different um and they will be adopted um globally so i would expect that and those things are becoming the norm so i would expect within the next couple of years we'll start seeing um, some of these changes becoming part of what we of what we do. Thank you. And Ashley, what, what do you see the window of time that we're looking at as? Well, this is very much the deciding decade. And I think, you know, as is reflected in a lot of our WPP commitments, they are very much, um, you know, we are going to get to net zero by 2025 and, of course, our supply chain by 2030. So we're very much focused on that. We've also included media buying and media placement in our in our in, in that target as well, which accounts for 50 percent of our total footprint. And we've uh, developed a carbon calculator as part of our media decarbonisation plan that we're I'm very happy to open source uh, and drive broad industry adoption so that we can all move faster together. Um, I think the thing that we will agree is that, you know, it, it's not something that's coming. It's here and it's absolutely part of everybody's day job now. And if it's not considered part of your day job, then you're definitely going to get left behind. Uh, so, so the urgency is now. And I think this is the decade that it has to happen. I think that's such a good point. It's everybody's day job. It's not the job of the sustainability team or some corporate team. It's everybody's day job. Every single decision you take wherever you are in our industry has a bearing or can have a positive bearing or it can have a neutral or it can have a negative bearing. So 
We've got to take all of those decisions and align them to the positive. Um, Karen, I, I mean, we've talked about Google's ambition in this. What do you, you and you serve a huge amount of the world's businesses? What, what do you see as the as the time frame to, for, for really significant change that we need to see? Yeah, we our our time frame and Ad Net Zero is aligned on 2030. We think now is the time for bold ideas, and uh, really, it's going to take all of us to collaborate. We have to remain humble and really work together. You talked about open sourcing; that's a valuable uh, way of working. But I also want to call out as marketers, uh, we have a lot of people who understand consumer behavior, who can identify those barriers and can begin to help make uh, consumers make sustainable choices as well as all of the things we can do corporately. So it's an exciting opportunity, but it has to happen because we're working together to do it. That's absolutely right. And I think actually it was a point, Angie, you made right at the very start where where you see advertisers that are using these sort of messaging, actually getting better returns because exactly. that's what consumers want. Yes. Yes. So basically, from, from my point of view, I can just I can just echo what has been said. It's an ongoing process. And 2030 is, you know, I think the first big milestone. Um, so I think, first of all, we need to see what can we uh, deliver significantly by 2030. And secondly, what are the additional opportunities to make improvements alongside that? And um, we reached already net uh, zero emissions for the global operations right now. That's the office and the data center. But the bigger topic, and it's going to be a difficult one, is uh, we have set a goal to achieve. And as you mentioned, this too, a net zero greenhouse gas emission um, across our entire value chain by the end of 2030. So that's a different animal that we are tackling right now. And uh, it's really great to see that many, many are, are setting this, the bar for 2030 very high and doing this. And for the second point around ongoing improvements, there is no deadline and uh, we should start now. Many of them have already started of our, you know, friends and companies and, you know, the society. And there is, and I love this really, several opportunities with this at net zero campaign. And uh, you mentioned that also before, measuring the emission from ads is something that we are particularly looking into and developing a standardized approach how to measure this. And uh, Sergio, I really loved your topics on the ad production. Our you know, marketing organization is also working on this. You know, what is the you know, emission there and how can we cut it to a smaller degree? And all this work, and I just want to finish with that, has to be done by everyone in the industry. And everybody needs to be part of this. We need to collaborate. We need to do this fast. We need to do this good together to really drive the change. Thank you, Andrew. That, that is, I, I'm not going to try and summarise because you have just done the one most wonderful summary of the discussion that we've had for the last half hour. Uh, thank you to all of you for your time. Thank you for this, the inspiration I feel that, that I've taken away from this conversation. Your companies are incredible supporters of Ad Net Zero uh, as we roll out around the world and make this the, the global programme for the industry. So thank you for your corporate support. Thank you for your insight today. And there's so much learning out of this. I think we can write we can write a small paper that we'll publish based on just this one panel. So thank you all very much, and uh, and great to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Great discussion. Thanks, Stephen. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Thank you, Bye. Stephen. Thank you.